And let's take our Bibles this evening and go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 in your Bibles. We're going to continue with our uh, series here on prayer. And really, uh, we, we've been looking at some background information a couple of weeks ago and then uh, some introduction to it in preparation for prayer. We're going to get into uh, the model prayer this evening. And so I'm excited about it. And uh, just by way of review, the focus, uh, this is the Sermon on the Mount. If you can remember, the Sermon on the Mount here, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the focus is on the fact that God's more concerned with who we are than simply what we do. It's not a matter of putting on a show. It's not a matter of doing certain acts. It's a matter of having the right heart. And worship to God that comes from a heart of righteousness. And not just an act of righteousness will show itself in many ways. Last week, if you look and you remember, we had a little hand down and had some notes. And we looked at a preparation for prayer. There's an understood proposition. Before we get to the model prayer, he said, when thou prayest. It must start there. Prayer must be our first resource. The secret to a great prayer life. Anybody remember what that is? The secret to a great prayer life is... Praying. praying. Yeah, it, it's just praying. There's no secret. We've got to do it. It doesn't matter how much we want to improve something. If we don't do it in the first place, we can't improve it. So there's an understood proposition he gave them and an unseen participation. He said it's not about uh, making something public. It's not about as far as uh, being seen in public, to be seen of men. He says, make your goal to be seen of me. God says those who are seen of men have their reward. Those who are seen of me get their reward from me. Then there was a unique position. He said, when you shut your door, singular prayer, just me and God. But in order for that to happen, we have to believe that he is. Remember, we looked at Hebrews 11, 6. God rewards when we recognize he's there. And then there's an unscripted petition. Use not, he says, vain repetition. It's not about saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, and so then we get to Matthew chapter 6 and look down in verse number 9. Begins our model prayer. Matthew 6, verse number 9. And here's what I want to ask you to do. As we read God's word here, we're going to read verses 9 through 13. I'm going to ask you to read it aloud with me uh, in your Bibles there. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, and we're going to go down to verse number 13. Ready? Begin. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Matthew 6, 9 through 13, the model of prayer. We're going to begin looking at that this evening. Let's bow for prayer and ask the Lord's blessing. Lord, as we now get into your word, I pray that you speak to us. Make it clear what you have for us. The devil wants no part of a praying Christian. The devil does not want us to take part in uh, that which he is something he cannot defeat. Something that he is powerless against. He can defeat us in our own flesh. In our own strength. But when we pray to you. It unleashes spiritual warfare. And a battle that he'll never win. And so we may. May we understand the importance. Of this. And not just feel something. But determine to act upon it. This evening. Help us we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Some people call this the Lord's prayer. This isn't the Lord's prayer. Uh, if it were, uh, we wouldn't need verse 12 and forgive us our debts. He had no debts. And so this is just a model prayer. He's, he's teaching them. He says in the very first verse that we read, verse 9, after this manner. Now be careful. After this manner does not mean just memorize this and repeat it. Say, how do you know it doesn't mean just memorize this and repeat it? Lest we forget what verses 7 and 8 say. Remember, use not vain repetition. So he's already said, and this is not something I want you to memorize and repeat after me as a trite saying. But he says, this is a model through which you need to pray. 
in this prayer, I see I see a, an attitude, an action, an asking, and an adoration that's giving. Oh, wow. Four different things. Now, those four things, we're going to take about 10 or 11 weeks to get through. All right? We're not going to speed through them. We're going to uh, take it, eat it slowly. Uh, when you have a good meal, and God's word is a good meal, when we have a good meal, it's not something we need to speed through. How many of you like a nice Juicy steak dinner. Yeah. yeah. Anybody? Just a few of you. Wonderful. I'm going to take the rest of you out to McDonald's sometime. <laughs> it's it's I love that. Yeah. When you have that steak, you don't, it's not a thing about let's go as fast as we can and scarf this down. That's not what it is. You want to enjoy it. You want to enjoy that flavor. And for some of you that need to get right with the Lord and have well done steak, come on. I don't know what the problem is. You need it. Medium, maybe. Some of you might even go to rare. I mean, I don't know about that. But you got to enjoy that flavor, right? Let's take our time going through this. And let's enjoy everything that, that he's given. I want us to look. All we're going to look at this evening is verse 9. And really just two words of verse 9. We're really going to slow her down. But the first thing I want us to notice is the attitude of prayer that's given here. The attitude of prayer. You say, what do you mean the attitude of prayer? The way that we approach someone determines a lot. When someone comes to you and you can see a certain attitude, it's going to determine how you respond to them. If you're in a place of authority and you can remember your children or maybe your student or something like that coming to you with a certain attitude. And usually when we say with an attitude, it's usually a bad attitude. Uh, but when they come with a certain attitude, it already shows motive. It already gives us a, a picture of something they want or something to accomplish. And we must be careful. I believe that this model prayer begins with a certain attitude by which we must approach God. There's so much packed into just this first verse that we're, we're going to break it down into three weeks. This evening in the attitude of prayer, we're going to remember his position, our Father. Next week, Lord willing, we'll, we'll realize his perspective, which are in heaven. And then the third week, we'll reflect on his person, hallowed be thy name. This is a certain attitude when we come before God and we do these things. Our attitude, the rest of our prayer is going to be... Completely different. It's going to change. No longer will we come to God demanding to know why. No longer will we come to God, God, I need this and I want this and why are you doing this? We will, it'll change our attitude. Our attitude will go from this and I don't understand this and why are you doing this to you're in charge. You see what I don't and you're holy. That changes it all changes our, our perspective right from the beginning. So tonight, we're just going to look at the first attitude of prayer given in this passage. I want us to remember his position. It says, after this manner, therefore pray ye, in the next two words, are our Father. Perhaps the greatest privilege that we have in speaking with an almighty God is the fact that that we can have a personal relationship with him. Think about it for just a moment. We're not just speaking to a creator who made everything, made the world, and sits back and watches it all happen. We're speaking with an almighty God who wants to be our father. His position is... His father. When a lost sinner recognizes his need for a savior and calls upon Christ, that sinner gains a father. We had three people gain a heavenly father this morning. Think back in the time uh, in your life when you prayed and trusted Christ as your savior. We a one-time deal. We have a one-time physical birthday, a one-time spiritual birthday. Maybe you don't remember the exact date, but you can go back in your mind's eye and remember when you perhaps bowed on your knees at a church service or there at home or with your family, your parents, or some, somehow you trusted Christ. Go back to that time. At that time, you gained a father. A father. If you're here tonight and you've always thought that you have a heavenly father, you know, many people in this world, in fact, the popular opinion will say God, God's all of our fathers. He's... He's a father to all of us. 
The truth of the matter is, even those who go to church, even those who are in a good family, who live a pretty good life, those who've been baptized, that's not what gains us a father. Those are all great things, but that doesn't mean that God is your father. I spoke with some this morning. One of them said, I believe in God. We looked at this a few weeks ago, but James 2.19 says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Just believing that there's a God is just not really enough. The devils also believe. It takes a whole lot of faith, though, to deny the existence of an almighty God. It's almost uh, crazy to me to see how the intellectuals will try to come up with another way to deny the existence of a creator. And the loops that they have to jump through. I think it's Brother Robert and I talking about it. Someone who says uh, they, they believe in Satan but don't believe in God. It's impossible. And then the, the, the back and forth, we can kind of go with that. But just trying to, just looking around. Uh, some beautiful sunsets this week. And sunrises here in, in this area. And, and someone made that. Trying to deny his existence. The truth of the matter is in the world we live in today, especially our politics, it's probably more of a desire to not have to be accountable for our lives than it is to be so smart that he's not recognized. So instead of instead of recognizing that he exists, now we just want to live our own way. And so if we just say he's not there, we don't have to be accountable to him. That's usually how it goes. But we know the Bible says by grace are you be saved. Through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. You and I cannot get to heaven on our own, no matter how good we may be. The question I often ask when someone says they're living a good life, why would Jesus have come and died on the cross if we can get there on our own? You see, he had to die in our place. Our sin needed to be paid for. Either we pay for it ourselves in hell, or we trust in his payment, his sacrifice, his sinless, perfect sacrifice. And we put our faith in him to save us. It's not just knowing there's a God. It's realizing that I can't do this on my own. It's putting my complete and total faith in Christ. It's not, I'm going to take Jesus plus this. It's not, I'm going to take Jesus plus baptism. Or I'm going to take Jesus plus my works. Or I'm going to take Jesus plus going to church. No, no, no. It's Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. It's all him. And here's what the Bible says happens in John 1, 12. A wonderful verse. But as many as received him, listen to this, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. We've gained a father, a child of God. What a privilege. And the way that we approach our Heavenly Father often is most determined by our upbringing, by our understanding of God that perhaps was taught and demonstrated to us by our authority. Each of us in here have a different story. When I mention the word father, that may be a good thing to some of you. The truth of the matter is, in the world we live in today, when I mention a father, that may be a bad thing to some of you. Perhaps you didn't have a good uh, upbringing or, or a good father figure. Uh, perhaps you didn't have a father in the picture at all. The encouraging thing we can find tonight, and we're going to see all throughout Scripture, is how... As a child of God, we have a loving Heavenly Father. We have a Father who will take care of us. We have a Father who will meet our needs. We have a Father who will be there for us. Whatever your situation may be in regard to that upbringing, we're going to look at who Jesus is, who, who God is as our Father this evening. And that can change our attitude towards Him. No matter what our earthly experience was or is with our Father, we can see the description of our Heavenly Father all throughout scripture. You see, a word is an extension of a person. Think about that for just a moment. If you want to know someone, something about someone, you look at what they said. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost scary today in the world we live in and someone uh, takes any kind of, 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 of a position of power and people go back 30 years ago and see what they wrote in their yearbook. That's kind of crazy to me. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to figure out who this person is. And the only way to do that is by their words. Who is this person? So let's take that and use that in regards to our Heavenly Father. We can know more about our Father by listening to and following His Word. This is an extension of Him. And so what this says can tell us much about Him. 
Let me read you a few verses about our Father. Okay. Psalm 68, verse 5 says this. He's a father to the fatherless. A father of the fatherless. My father passed away when I was nine. I've had many men in my life that have stepped up and, and have helped. And a grandfather and a youth pastor and a pastor and another pastor. I've had four or five men that have become like a father to me. The Bible says he's a father of the fatherless. Maybe your father's not in the picture. Can I tell you? Your heavenly father is there. James 1.17 says this. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down where? From the father. Every good gift in our life. Can I tell you? It's from your heavenly father. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 63, 16 says, Doubtless thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. That's our father. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 and 4 says, Blessed be God, even the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies. The God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. You and I have a heavenly father this evening who wants to comfort you in your tribulation. A father of mercies. Psalm 103, 13 says this, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. God has compassion for you. 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now it says our Heavenly Father has a great amount of love for us. Deuteronomy 32, 6, Do you thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy Father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? All these verses this evening and many others tell us about our Heavenly Father. You see, He's more than just our Creator. He's more than just in charge of the universe. He loves us. He cares for us. He redeemed us. He comforts us. He's there for us. That's our Father. In His position as our Father, let us remember a few things. I'll give you three of them and we'll be finished. First of all, I want you to remember, as our Father, He knows what's best. He knows what's best. How many fathers in here this evening? You have, uh, have, have or have had children. Yeah, many of us fathers. Younger children still in the home. Go back to that time. You have younger children still in the home. Children, especially at young age, and I don't know if they do as a teenager. I don't have teenagers yet, but they ask for some pretty outrageous things. <laughs> Many mothers in here, I'm sure as well, can testify to this. Sometimes they're simple. Sometimes it's specific. Sometimes it's ice cream for breakfast, right? There's some simple things that children ask for. And here's the thing. I would not be doing my job as a father if I were to give my child everything they ask for. I wouldn't be doing my job. Why? Because I know what's best for them. As a father, especially with younger children, I know what's best for them. The world doesn't have that philosophy these days. I shared briefly a little bit about that this morning in our message, but we live in a, a world of entitled young people. It's not the fault most of the time, though, of the young people, in my opinion. In those cases, I believe the fault often lies at the feet of the parents who in an effort to be a friend or a buddy of their child give in to every desire of their children. Sometimes I hear people say, well, I didn't get anything as a child and I don't want my children to experience that, so I'm going to give them everything I can. The real issue, though, is rather than living by God's standard and by God's method and by God's pattern of raising children, we follow the patterns and whims of the world. The bad part about that is, is that it's often changing. You know, I, I don't, it, it's no coincidence that we have more how-to books. We have more information. We have more things readily available at our fingertips for parenting these days than we've ever had. And yet, I believe if we look in the world today, our children are worse off than they've ever been. It doesn't matter how many things we can come up with. If we go away from God's word, it's not going to work. God has a way. God has a plan. And we've got to follow that. The truth of the matter is our children 
are not really ours anyway. Our children are gifts from God. Because they're His, we must raise them His way. So if you're saying in here, what's this for, Pastor? I don't need to listen to this. I don't have children. I want you to understand Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. I'll just read it for you. You don't have to turn it. You can if you like. Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 7 give us specific instructions for parents. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Notice, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I say that pretty much covers all the time. When you're sitting down, when you're laying down, when you're walking, when you're, when you're about, God says, as parents, be teaching your children of me. Be teaching your children of love from me, of love from my word. A father knows what's best. My job as a father is not to give my children everything they want, but to instruct them in the ways of my heavenly father. A father knows what's best for his children. I think we can all understand that. But let's remember spiritually now then. Our Heavenly Father knows what's best for his children. I don't know if you've been in this situation. I have. Asking and asking and asking and asking for something that I believe is best. And yet, I have a Heavenly Father who knows what's best. And though we think it's silly sometimes of wanting uh, pizza for breakfast or whatever the case may be as a child and the silly request, spiritually, oftentimes we come before God with something that he knows as our Heavenly Father is not what's best. At that point, we have a decision to make. Are we going to trust him? When we come to God in prayer, our attitude will change when we remember his position as Father, that he knows What's best? Can you trust your father this evening, your heavenly father? We read many verses, and I'll even read some more in just a moment about our father, but he's worth our trust. He's worth our devotion. He's worth our life. He's worth our love. We must remember his position. As we go to prayer, remember, we're speaking to someone who knows what's best, but second of all, Remember also, not only that he knows what's best, but that he wants what's best. Not only does he know what's best, but also he wants what's best. I don't know of any parent really in here, I'm sure I can speak for everyone, that you don't, I don't know of any parent who doesn't want what's best for their child. I mean, it doesn't matter what situation we may be referring to or talking to, you want what's best for your child. I had the privilege and opportunity for a few years to be a coach of one of my children uh, and their soccer. And I got to coach Isaac's team for a little while. I wanted the best for him. Um, the, the, program, uh, <laughs> the program that I was a part of in that soccer league, it was great. There were a lot of Christian values in it. Um, but it called for a lot of fairness, fairness of playing time. And everybody gets a chance and we don't keep score and all this stuff. There's a lot of things that were great about it. There's a lot of things I didn't like about it either. You don't keep score. Yeah, right. We're keeping score over here on the bench. This person didn't play as much as this person, and you have to be careful with that. Yeah, that person hasn't been to practice in two months. You're why are so these are things that are going through my mind. I want what's best for my child. When I go and watch my kids play on Saturday mornings, I don't. <laughs> I probably should. My wife probably gets a little embarrassed. I need to work on this. I don't just sit there and watch them. Good job. Go hard. That's not me. <laughs> Isaac, over here, on this side. He's about to get here. Go on this side. Come over here. Be ready. Here, come. That's me. Coaching from the sideline again and going this and going. I want what's best. I want to be able to score. We brag on for just a moment. Isaac's team's horrible. Okay? <laughs> the thing's bad. They haven't sc scored a goal in all five games. Except for two goals that he scored in one game and they won. So, two goals for the whole team all year. Anyway, uh, he's, he's doing – they're doing better. They're doing better. No, they're not. They're not that good. But uh, Michaela's team's real good. They've won every game. Uh, but anyway, I want what's best for them. Right? Not just in, not just in, in sports. But what about in school? I want them to do their best. I, I want them to be uh, this and, and that. And, and 
I want what's best for my child in life. Right, I'm their father. I, I want them to succeed. I want them to do well. As much as, and the truth of the matter is, they want to do well as well. They don't want to go out there and just play for a little bit and then ask the coach, can I go sit down? I'm tired. I liked it. Oftentimes, the coach brings them out and they go right back up to the coach. I'm good now. Can I go back in? I like that. They want to do well. Uh, sometimes in their, uh, in their schooling and they're working on something, they're checking something, and they'll bring it to me. Dad, is this okay because I put this instead of this? I'm like, that's the exact same thing. Yes, it's fun. It wants to do well. And as much as they're concerned about doing well, follow me here, as much as they're concerned about their life as their father, I'm much more concerned. As much as they want to do well, I want them to do so much better. Because I'm their father. And I want what's best. And you and I have a heavenly father this evening. As much as we want to succeed in life, as much as we want to do well in whatever area or position we may find ourselves in, can I tell you, you have a Heavenly Father who wants it more? He wants what's best for you. To an infinitely higher degree. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Bible says, I know the thoughts that I have to you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God says, I want what's best for you. Even more than we want it for ourselves. And so when you and I go to the Lord in prayer, whether it be this evening, an invitation, and tomorrow as we walk with Him, as we spend time with Him throughout the day, throughout the week, as we go to prayer, let's have our attitude remembering His position. He's our Father who loves us, who knows what's best, who wants what's best. And third of all, this evening, finally, Remember that he will do what's best. He knows what's best. He wants what's best. And then ultimately, he'll do what's best. You're there in Matthew 6. Look down in verse number 31. The Bible says this, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. And we'll keep reading in just a moment. But he's saying, don't spend your life and your time worrying. How is this going to turn out? Lord, I don't have this. What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? He says, no, no, no. Take no thought. Why? The end of verse 32. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need. All these things. He says, I'm your father. I already know that you have need of these things. Look back in verse number 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth, watch this, what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So we have a father who knows what's best. We have a father who wants what's best. And praise the Lord, we have a heavenly father who will do what's best for us. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways of judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Psalm 111, verse 7, The works of his hands are verity, that's truth, and judgment. All his commandments are sure. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. All these verses and many more I could go on reading show us that we can trust him, our Father. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, Lord, help me to remember you're my Father. You know what's best for me. As I think about my children and I put myself in that position, I see that you also want what's best for me. And God, may I have the faith and the trust to believe that you're going to do what's best for me. These verses, as I've read, show us that we can trust him. But here's the thing. Our Heavenly Father will not force His way upon us. As a loving Heavenly Father, He gives us a choice. 
to listen to, to follow him, or to go our own way. And though he knows what's best, though he wants what's best, though he'll do what's best, we don't have to follow him. He's not going to make us a robot and you got to do this and you got to do this. No, we have the choice. Are we going to go our own way or are we going to follow him? When my children want something that I know is not best for them, I don't give it to them. They may not understand, but it's their job at that point to trust me. By the way, as it probably happened in your family, what happens when they want something? When I say no, and they do it anyway. When they go ahead and get their own way. Do you think it turns out the way they were thinking? Did it turn out the way you were thinking when you were a child? Did uh, Was the board of education applied to the seat of learning? Uh, in, so, in so many words. Get a whooping for it. Yes. Why? Because I know what's best. You went your own way. You got what you thought what you wanted. But now you're going to get a response from us. And that's where our Heavenly Father is as well. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that we have a Heavenly Father. One who knows what's best, wants what's best, and will do what's best. If he's not your Heavenly Father this evening, can I tell you, you're missing out. You're missing out on one who loves you, who wants what's best for you, who will do what's best for you. And here's the wonderful thing. He's ready to become your father tonight. You can get that taken care of. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. I'm going to invite you to come. I invite you to pray. I invite you to take my hand, and we'll have someone show you how you can know for sure that heaven will be your home. It's not worth missing out on, but Christian, maybe you have a heavenly father. You know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. Can I remind us? Have we forgotten who we're praying to? When we come to God in prayer, it would be good for us to Adjust our attitude and remember his position, our Father. When we adjust our attitude in prayer, it can comfort our hearts in the time of need. See, when I go to him in a desperate time, in a situation where I don't see any good for this circumstance, where I don't understand why I'm in the position that I'm in, and I go to God and if I just begin with remembering that, hold on, I may not understand, but he knows what's best. I don't see how this is going to work out, and all I'm going to do is be uh, discouraged, and, and this is just, I don't see any way out. He wants what's best. There's no way that this is all going to work out together. There's no way it's all going to fit, and I just don't see it. Hold on, he will do what's best. Remember his position, our Father. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.